The Pittsburgh Penguins are red hot, and Sidney Crosby reaches another milestone. Connor McDavid continues to thrive, and we, of course, have our very first guest spot with Erica Ayala to talk a little women's hockey, plus all of the schedule coming up for this weekend, all that and more on today's Locked On NHL podcast. Your Locked On NHL, your daily podcast on the National Hockey League. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And happy Friday, everybody, and welcome to the Locked On NHL podcast. I am Gil Martin. You could find me on Twitter at IceWarsNYRVSNYI. And it is my pleasure every Friday to do this show with Rachel Donner. You could find her on Twitter at R Miriam. And happy Friday, Rachel. Happy Friday, Gil. Uh, wanna I, thank I everybody. have a morning oh, sorry, win. I have well, a morning win you from do. last night. You so do. I'm in a better mood talk than usual. About that for <laughs> sure. First, wanted to thank everyone for making Locked On NHL your first listen every day. We are free and available on all platforms. Rachel, why don't we start with that win? Uh, Carter Hart, not not everyone expected this result. Talk to me about it. Yeah, listen, 48 saves on 49 shots uh, against the New Jersey Devils. This is the second game this year that he's had to face more than 45 shots. Uh, It's not ideal in the grand scheme of things, (laughs) but... He came up huge. Uh, Aside from one absolutely spectacular Jack Hughes goal, he was stopping breakaways, two-on-ones. He was on it on the penalty kill. Uh, One of his most dialed-in games I I have ever seen him play and uh, definitely saved the Flyers, uh, and they were able to escape with that two-to-one win. Yeah, very big. And and what's with the Devils all of a sudden? They seem to be cooling off just a little bit. Yeah, I think the underlying numbers weren't always there for them, really. Even when they were winning all those games, you know, they were finding ways to win. But sometimes eventually that runs out. And I think, you know, for me, when you see a team that has an extended win streak like that, sometimes they don't know how to bounce back from a loss really well. And so when they have like two losses in a row, the, the cracks start to form, right? And they just don't know how to recover for it versus a team that, you know, wins three or four in a row, loses one, wins three or four in a row, loses one. I think it's a different mentality. I think you're right. And it, it was very, uh, you know, interesting. I didn't expect the Devils to continue at the pace they were at. But now the question right. is, how far do they fall and, and, and when can they recover? I think they'll be contenders, though, the rest of the way. Oh, sure. I mean, obviously, they're still, you know, atop the division. But, you know, there are other teams that are itching to take over that spot uh, who are in the two and three spot. And I I think we're going to have to talk about at least one of them. Yeah, yeah. And there's going to there's going to be a race. That division, I think the, the Metropolitan will go all the way to the wire. Let, let's talk about the Pittsburgh Penguins. I know this doesn't bring you great joy, but uh, they are now on a seven-game winning streak. And Chris Letang, his first goal after suffering the stroke, and then multiple point game uh, game for Letang, Evgeny Malkin, and Sidney Crosby, who now has 225 career multi-assist games, which ties him with Steve Eiserman for 12th on the NHL's all-time list. Yeah, I mean, everything aside, it was so incredible to see Chris Letang get back out on the ice so soon after the stroke and and to see him play well and to get that goal. Uh, I, you know, regardless of your fan allegiance, I think it's a it's a good thing to see in the game. And, you know, I it felt like a game for the Pens that was like a classic Penn's game with those guys contributing and you know it just goes to show you that you know they may be a little bit older now but they can still just take over a game just the three of them 
Yeah, it wouldn't it may not happen as often as it did when they were a little younger, but boy, you never can count those guys out. And uh, seven in a row for the Penguins. They are healthy and they're hitting on all cylinders right now. Uh, Connor McDavid also hitting on all cylinders. 60 points in 31 games. Not bad for Mr. McDavid. Not bad at all. Uh, I think, you know, he would probably wish for a little bit more consistency with the Oilers. But at the same time, you know, on a personal level, he is just uh, extraordinary this season. And I would not be surprised if he won, um, you know, the Hart Trophy, the Conn Smythe. uh, Any of those things could happen this year. But um, he did run into a little bit of trouble last night uh, with his overtime winner or supposed overtime winner getting called back for offsides. And he was a little, you know, uh, as much as Connor McDavid can get salty, he was a little salty. That's not usually, you know, it's kind of hard to tell with him sometimes. But uh, I think that he... Yeah, he just sort of put it in a general like, oh, they have to let us know what all of these things mean. What is offsides? What is goaltender interference to try and like deflect that he was upset about the whole thing. But, you know, having watched the replay several times and it, I think it's important when you watch those replays that you watch them at full speed, because I think slow-mo tends to really distort what you're seeing there. And, you know, he thinks he has control of the puck. Uh, because he's dangling and that's, you know, Connor McDavid doing Connor McDavid things. But to me, um, you know, I, was it um, Riley? Um, I forget who it was on the blues. They got a stick in there, but, right. uh, but that I, I believe that was enough to make him lose control. So that is my opinion on it. But what's your take? Well, it's always a judgment call. I, I think he had lost control of it even momentarily and when you watch it at full speed it is difficult to to make that call it, it's something that the the linesman has to judge and uh you know getting the war room involved in it always sort of complicates it i think to a certain level but you want the league to get the call right yeah and so sometimes when you are right technically on something even if it doesn't make sense in the grand scheme of the play or the sequence, you know, that that's what you, that's what the rule is, right? So you just got to go with what the rule is, regardless of whether you think it had an ultimate effect on the outcome of the play. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's, it's frustrating for a great player like McDavid when that happens, but you got to get the call right. Can't show favoritism. So. That is true. I wanted to, one more thing from last night. I definitely wanted to, to touch on another outstanding performance by Jake Ottinger of the uh, Dallas Stars. 45 saves for him. Uh, not as many as Carter Hart, but pretty impressive <laughs> nonetheless. And uh, the Dallas Stars are playing pretty darn well. They are. And he's a huge, huge part of, of why that is. And, you know, we've been having this conversation about him and Carter Hart Um and a couple of other guys, but mostly those two in terms of them stealing games on, you know, for their teams more than, than not. But yeah, I think this season for those two is, uh, is a real good one so far. No question. Well, we have got a lot more to get to on today's show. We will be uh, joined by Erica Ayala to talk a little women's hockey. And of course we have our look ahead Uh, to this weekend's most exciting games, all that and more still to come on this episode of the Locked On NHL podcast. And now an important message from the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. You're hanging out with some friends, you're putting back a few drinks, but a few becomes a few too many as the evening comes to an end and people start to leave. You think of calling for a ride, but you live nearby. You can make it home okay. It's no big deal. What are the odds you're going to get pulled over anyway? And even so, what's the worst that can happen? Your insurance goes up, you lose your license, you could lose your job, you total your car, you can injure someone. 
everybody knows about the risks of driving drunk and the results are often tragic and deadly. However, that still doesn't stop everyone from getting behind the wheel while under the influence. That's why police officers are out there right now looking for impaired drivers on our roads. So if you think you're okay to drive after a few drinks, think again. You should play it safe and plan ahead to get a ride. It only takes one mistake to change your life or someone else's forever. Drive sober or get pulled over. And welcome back to the to the Friday edition of Locked On NHL. It is my pleasure right now to introduce Erica Ayala. Uh, she is going to join us every other week to talk a little women's hockey. And uh, Erica, how are you today? Hey, I'm doing well. Thank you so much for um, inviting me on. Gil and Rachel, it's always a pleasure to, as I say, squad cast with you both uh, on your individual shows and then, of course, on the NHL show as well. Well, it's great to have you here. And and this is a, a great time to have you on. So much going on in women's hockey right now. What to you is the biggest headline that, that you want to start us off with here? Well, as you mentioned, yes, there is a lot happening. But I think if we look at the bigger picture, the, the one story that has come up in the last roughly 24 hours has been that the Premier Hockey Federation, formerly known as the National Women's Hockey League, has increased their salary cap to $1.5 million per team. Now, since 2021, this particular league has increased the salary cap alone by 900%. And there are a lot of things to get into. One, obviously, this is an increase, but I think also it's worth placing this into a little bit of context regarding actually the WNBA. I happen to be wearing my WNBA <laughs> shirt. Now, a lot of people are, are noting that, um, you know, this is a salary cap that is beyond what we see in the WNBA. Uh, that being said, that doesn't mean that these players are going to be making salaries that are commensurate with what WNBA players are making. And there are a few reasons for that. Chief among them, there are more hockey Fewer players. players. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Fewer players in the WNBA, more players in on a on a hockey roster that goes at all levels. <laughs> so, but it is really great news. I think what we're seeing is that this new ownership group under now Commissioner Reagan Carey, who was uh, over the women's programming at USA Hockey for a time, we're seeing that there is a commitment to these players uh, that of course raises a lot of questions in what we'll see regarding a collective bargaining agreement and things right. of that nature. So there are still things to be sorted out, but I think we can definitely say it's a step in the right direction for women's professional hockey. And, yeah, and one of my um, big questions is there's several players in the league who signed two year deals with a lower salary cap. Yes. Uh, what does that mean for their contracts? Rachel, that's a great question. And yesterday I was actually able to speak with the executive director of the Premier Hockey Federation, PHF Players Association. And there's a few things that are worth noting. There is a standard contract in the Premier Hockey Federation, the PHF. That being said, there are certain clauses, including the details of a, of a multi-year contract, which is relatively new for this league, um, those things are individualized and each individual athlete with their team or representation is able to make those changes. Now, given that those are individual clauses, some of those players wrote their clauses in such a way that it says, you know, this is your salary or um, you will get X amount percentage of the overall cap, whichever is ah. greater. So there are some players that already have that baked in. And so I did ask Nicole, again, the executive director of the Players Association, not a formal union, also want to note that. And she did say that the plan is now that the news is live, and this was something that came from the league, there wasn't really a negotiation because, again, not a union yet. Um, but the, the Players Association will prepare to have conversations to keep, of course, their utmost goal intact, which is, of course, to do what's best for the players. So we don't know what that's going to look like. There are plans to have those conversations. 
And there are some players that regardless of how the conversations go, should be covered. Very, very good. Big tournament coming up this weekend. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so I think that we have uh, the Rivalry Series. We actually had a game yesterday, and then we'll have one on Monday. Now, the Rivalry Series is the United States and Canada pitted together in an exhibition game that then travels throughout North America. The first three games, uh, there were two that were in Canada and then one in Seattle at Climate Pledge Arena, which you both know I'm very familiar with. Uh, and yes. then yesterday they played in Henderson. That is the ice sheet of the uh, Silver Knights. I believe that's the AHL affiliate yes. for the Vegas Golden Knights. And then on Monday, they'll be playing at the arena formerly known as Staples, <laughs> where the Kings <laughs> play uh, at Crypto.com. And so this is an opportunity for the two... I don't even think it's really arguably at this point, the two most decorated women's national teams to go head to head. Coming into this series, Canada not only won the Olympic gold medal in 2022, Rachel and I got to talk a lot about that we earlier did. in the year, we did, uh, but they also won world championships, which was held in Denmark. So they are coming in as the reigning champions any way you slice it. That being said, they dropped the first three games, Gil, uh, to the United States, who have been on a tear. That all changed, though, yesterday. Once again, it was a back-and-forth game. We've already had one of these games go into overtime. It was a back-and-forth game, and Sarah Nurse ends up with the game-winning goal for Canada. She's so, so for good. She's amazing, and I got to speak to her, and I'll have some reporting um, about this a little bit later in uh in the, the or i should say next week but um sarah nurse had a gnarly injury uh she talked about the, that she had a time like a a time to skate that she did and she was like i don't even know how anyone thought i had ever skated before after looking back at that video but she makes the olympics MVP of the tournament uh went from a fourth liner at world championships prior to the olympics um as a center to then jumping up as the top line left wing, just because her her teammates and her coaching staff knew that she could be flexible in that way. And she has that whatever it takes mentality. So Sarah Nurse within that series has such a great story. But then you have Hillary Knight, who is making all kinds of records, particularly at the IH level and world championships on the women's side of things. Uh, you know, leading scorer for the United States, but also has evolved her game. I think she's known as a finesse player. She has good size, but has not really had to use it um, or make it a part of her game on a shift to shift basis. She's doing a little bit more of that. And so it's just really exciting. So we'll see. Canada now has a little bit uh, of, of a taste of what it is to win in this series. So we'll see what, uh, what Monday brings. That will be the last uh, game in 2022, but the rivalry series will continue in 2023. I thought it was uh, pretty cool that Amanda Kessel scored a goal and that Phil Kessel yeah. scored in the NHL within seconds of each other. Yes, that was so wild. Uh, you know, speaking of Vegas, you know, uh, Phil Kessel uh, is with them now. But um, yeah, that was really wild. And then, of course, the sibling rivalry goes mm -hmm. back and forth. And Sarah Nurse. Uh, she is related to Darnell Nurse. Now, Darnell Nurse's sister, Kia, plays in the WNBA, but Sarah is his cousin. So there was a, a, a lot of uh, NHL rivalry series overlap on social media yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Keep it. Keeping it all in the family. Exactly. I love the intensity of the USA-Canada rivalry. I mean, you're really seeing in my mind, the two best women's hockey programs in the world. How intense does this rivalry get? It gets pretty intense. So in speaking with both coaches and a few players, I also spoke to Abby Rock, who is the top line center for the United States. Um, the, we call each four-year cycle a quad um, in women's hockey, and that includes world championships, and then it, it kind of 
everything resets after the Olympic tournament. Um, so in this quad, we're early in this quad since we just had the Olympics at the top of the year. All the players, all the coaches know the the long game is to get your world championship roster together, get some young players, especially now that we're at the end of the year who are in college, get them in the lineup. That being said, as I mentioned, these have been one, maybe two goal games for the majority of the series. It gets very spicy. We saw a lot of skirmishes last night in particular. And Abby Rock, I, I tweeted uh, for Kraken fans, you know, she's got that Yanni Gord in her where she'll mix it up and then she skates away just like hysterically laughing as if to just kind of, you know, give another punch to the other side. Like you are unfazed. I am unfazed by you. So it definitely gets spicy. Uh, th that being said, we know that these, these two teams and these two organizations have a bigger goal, but as Troy Ryan, the head coach of Canada said, Hey, we never want to lose and we never want to lose to the United States. It does take a little bit to keep that into perspective, but we do want to play the long game. And so right now it's still a little bit of a feeling out process, but once we get closer to spring and world championships, when another medal is on the line, I think we'll see it pick up even more. Love it. Absolutely love it. Erica, why don't you tell our viewers and our listeners where they could find you on social media and where they could learn more about women's hockey. For sure. Again, thanks for having me. You can find me over on the Locked on Kraken show, which just like every other Locked on show can be found anywhere you listen to audio podcasts and on YouTube. And then you can find me personally at elindsay08, E-L-I-N-D-S-A-Y-08. And this weekend, we also have Premier Hockey Federation returning to yes. Acton. It's their last set of games before we close out the 2022 portion. I'll be on four of those games, including tonight, Friday, the Buffalo Believes Classic, which is the annual outdoor game in Western New York. You can find those on ESPN+. Plus. All right, Erica, thank you so much for joining us. Always a pleasure to have you. Likewise, thank you so much. Enjoy your holiday season. And welcome back to the Locked On NHL podcast. Rachel, we're, we're back to a more normal schedule this weekend, but some pretty entertaining games coming up. Uh, not as many Friday games, as I said, uh, but to me, the one that stands out the most, the St. Louis Blues in Calgary to take on the Flames Two teams that are a little disappointing so far this year and trying to get their consistency back. Yeah, it, it has been a really tough season for Calgary so far. And, you know, things just are not clicking for them in a way that you might have expected. I think they had a lot of change in the offseason and that has really affected them, I think, more than some other teams maybe that had a, a little bit of upheaval. Uh, and then you have St. Louis coming in off of that, um, oh no, we lost the game, but wait, we won the game in a shootout <laughs> uh, emotional roller coaster that we talked about earlier uh, with the Connor McDavid controversial overtime uh, goal taken back. So, you know, will they still have that energy moving forward into this game? And uh, that should make for an interesting contest. No question. Uh, my Islanders are also in Arizona to take on the Coyotes. Uh, first visit to the Mullet Arena. And, you know, the Islanders, this is a, a difficult road trip. This almost becomes a must-win game. You have the Penguins, the Capitals, uh, you know, the, the Hurricanes all playing so well. The Islanders, even though they're five games over NHL 500, still kind of slipping down in the standings in the Metropolitan. Yeah, like you said earlier in the show, that division is getting super tough right now. And yeah, like Carolina's on a three-game win streak. The Rangers are on a five-game win streak. So uh, no one wants to give up their spot. Yeah, yeah. That, that one is going to go down to the wire, no question about it. Saturday, we have a very, very busy schedule. Any of the matinees stick out in your mind? Well, we were talking before we started recording the show about this Ottawa-Detroit game and the fact that uh, Detroit just seems like a much, much better team than Ottawa right now, but they're actually pretty similar as points go. And uh, just with, with all those loser points, it's, uh, I think there's something weird going on with Ottawa as well. I think 
they they had a lot of change and and on paper it looked really really good but it hasn't clicked for them entirely this season whereas you know Detroit is just taking another step in the overall plan that Steve Eiserman has and I think that uh, you know they've had a more cohesive rebuild there than maybe Ottawa has and so it's always interesting to see those two kinds of teams play each other. No question about it. I, I love this East-West matchup at 7 o'clock Eastern time. The Dallas Stars in Raleigh to take on the Hurricanes. Uh, two teams playing some pretty good hockey lately. Yeah, I mean, we were just talking about Dallas uh, earlier in the show with um, Ottinger playing really well. And, you know, Dallas is still at the top of the central division, although uh, Winnipeg does have a couple games in hand on them, just below them. And I think that, you know, they're going to want to continue those winning ways because they have Winnipeg nipping at their heels. And then Carolina, again, you know, wanting to maybe try and overtake New Jersey at the top of the division and they have to keep Pittsburgh, you know, (laughs) away. So, it should be a really good battle. No doubt about that. Martin St. Louis will be facing his former team. Uh, at He is now, of course, coach of the Canadiens, the Tampa Bay Lightning coming to Montreal. That is always a little extra dimension. I love that. I love that. And I love what Marty St. Louis has been able to do in Montreal. Uh, that has been a pleasant surprise, I would say from a coaching perspective and uh, yeah, love it when, you know, people who played for a particular team then go on to coach somewhere else and, you know, facing their old teams and uh, stuff like that. It's, it's a lot of fun to watch. Flyers hosting the Rangers Saturday night, always a great rivalry game there. And can the Flyers build on Carter Hart's outstanding performance of last night? I would hope so. You know, like I said, the Rangers have won five in a row. Uh, They've been playing much, much better as of late. They were very discombobulated for a while, but uh, the Rangers are finding ways to win now and uh, and doing that consistently. So that's going to be a real tough one for the Flyers. How about Toronto and Washington? Uh, Mitch Marner's streak finally coming to an end, but Marner and, and, you know, all, all those talented players on the Maple Leafs going up against Ovechkin, who just passed, you know, the 800 career goal mark. That should be an entertaining hockey game. Yeah, I mean, that streak was a lot of fun while it lasted for Marner. But in some ways, I think the pressure like gets built up so high that it's almost good that it's over. And now yeah. like they can just kind of settle and not worry about getting Mitch Marner a point in a particular game. And I think that'll bode well for them against a team like Washington and where you have to be, you know, very focused on a guy like Ovechkin. Um, again, he just had that milestone 800 goal. So maybe he can relax. And so you have two guys in a, in circumstances where, you know, they've reached a certain level and now, you know, they can play a more like holistic game. The Florida Panthers visiting the Devils. Can the Devils get back on track? And and the Panthers still sticking around NHL 500 after winning the President's Trophy a year ago. Yeah, they're still like trying to find their game, though. It's been uh, a little bit of a, a rough season for them. You know, they're in after that, they're in fifth place right now in the Atlantic. And yeah, I, I don't know, man. I <laughs> I have my doubts about that team, but they could be a team that peaks late, right? Yeah. I just, yeah. I just think with all that talent and to have their goal differential only be plus two is a little concerning. They like they really need to be like a lot more solid defensively, I think, if they're gonna move forward this year. I I agree, and the defensive consistency needs to be there. How about Winnipeg? And we talked about them uh, with the games in hand they have on Dallas. Visiting Vancouver at 10 o'clock on Saturday night. Well, I mean, honestly, I will probably be in bed at that point. (laughs) But, you know, East Coast bias. But, uh, yeah, I think that'll be a fun matchup just because I think 
you know, Winnipeg, this is a game that they absolutely can win and should win. And so, you know, it's just a matter of playing the game right. But Vancouver, you know, they're seven and three in their last 10 and have turned things around a little bit. So they're going to, you know, with the um, all Canadian matchup, they're not going to want to just like let Winnipeg steamroll them. Right. So uh, it, it should be a fun one. And then on Sunday, we have five games on the schedule. Pittsburgh and Carolina, big matchup in the Metropolitan Division. Yeah, yeah. I think, uh, you know, those are the two that are scrambling to try and overtake the Devils. So, uh, and only one, well, multiple teams, I guess, could get points. But, yeah, no overtime. Um, <laughs> no, yeah. That's, that's really what we want is no overtime on this one. <laughs> Uh, another good game, 8 o'clock Eastern time on Sunday, Winnipeg in Seattle. Kraken, you know, coming back to earth a little bit and Winnipeg coming off a back-to-back from Saturday. Yeah, so I think, you know, Seattle wants to get back to more consistent winning. Um, Winnipeg, it might be a little exhausted, although the travel from Vancouver to Seattle is pretty easy, so uh, <laughs> it shouldn't affect them too much. No, it it really shouldn't, but uh, we shall see how it all plays out. Should be an interesting weekend of hockey for sure. I want to thank you again for making Locked On NHL your first listen today. For your second listen, check out Locked On Sports Today. From the games that matter the most to the biggest stories in sports, go beyond the scoreboard and behind the scenes with local experts and insights only Locked On can provide. Locked On Sports Today, available on this app, YouTube, and wherever you get your podcasts. Should be uh, a great weekend ahead. I want to thank everyone for listening to the Locked On NHL podcast. I will be back on Monday uh, to talk with three of our local experts about the biggest stories from around the league. Have a great weekend, everybody. Stay safe, and thanks for listening to the Locked On NHL podcast.